evening, Delaware Contemporary friends. I'm Josh Hollingsworth, engagement manager here at the museum. Um, I'm excited to have the uh, chance to virtually sit down with writer, educator, um, and spoken word poet Jasmine Combs. Jasmine Combs is currently exhibiting in a collaborative exhibition titled Definitive Work. As you may know, this season's theme is objectifying the object. Education had the uh, privilege of meeting and working with Jasmine in 2020. Uh, so we knew she would be a perfect in interpreting the theme, but in her own style. Throughout this exhibition, we had the chance to collaborate with Delaware College Art and Design's first years. Uh, through that collaboration, students were invited to respond to Jasmine's work through a written statement, but also through their own work. We're currently jurying those works with Jasmine, and we'll be sharing them with the world very soon. Uh, so without further ado, Jasmine, before we talk about the exhibition itself, uh, would you mind introducing yourself and sharing your overall practice with our viewers? Uh, sure. Um, I'm a Philadelphia-based uh, poet, spoken word artist, uh, teaching artist, um, editor, anything kind of evolving the literary arts I kind of dabble in. Um, as far as my process, I've been writing since I was old enough to know how to pull up, you know, pick up a pencil. Um, and I've been just kind of following that dream into whatever door it has led me into. And luckily, um, Delaware Contemporary is one of the doors that it's led me to. Nice, nice. So that actually leads me into my first question. Um, can you talk about your process at all? Sure, my process for writing, it kind of differs depending on the piece. I think that the, the poems that of mine that I like the most are the ones that kind of come to me naturally, always based off my own experiences, kind of lines, phrases that just kind of come to me in peace and piece themselves together in my head before I put them down on paper. Um, aside from that, I take a lot of workshops. I, I read a lot and I try to pull from other black writers, other contemporary black artists, um, see what they're saying about the times and how their narratives um, can intertwine with mine and you know my own stories. Describe for someone um, who is not too familiar with spoken word, what, what is spoken word and um, are there any limits when writing a spoken word poetry? Hmm, limits. Well, spoken word poetry is uh, it's just taking poetry back to its roots in the oral tradition. Um, poetry that is performed on a stage, poetry that's often memorized. And it's not just about reading the words that are on your page. It's about also incorporating theater and, and different tonalities in order to keep your audience engaged in the words that you're saying. So it's a combination between um, performance as well as writing, at least for me. Um, what was the second part of the question? Um, I'm just wondering, are there any limits um, in, in that medium? I don't know if I would say there are limits. I think that, um, I think the only limit that I would say is to, to not be boring. A lot of critiques that I get from other, not from, but about other writers who do readings or people who are not you know, trained in spoken word or in any type of performance poetry is that they don't have the emotion that's in their piece and that's in their work doesn't translate through their voice because they are, you know, they're not experienced in that realm. And that um, can often make the audience or the reader or whoever is you know, engaging with that piece feel disengaged. So I would say the only limit would be um, folks who are interpreting spoken word as just speaking the words out loud and not digging deeper into how you're speaking those words in order to you know, make an influence on someone. Right, right. And so uh, you've actually taught me a lot, uh, you know, since we've been working with you uh, since last year, it's been a year. <laughs> it's so crazy. Um, but you've actually taught me a lot through through your spoken word and um, how how strong those those words and those sentences could be. Um, but I'm sure that's only if you're really choosing to dig deep. Right. As a as a as a listener, you're, you have to choose to, um, you know, I guess, accept what it what is being what is being told by the spoken word poet mm -hmm. um yeah so i'm i'm learning to i'm learning to you know train my mind to be more open when when you know i in your gallery per se when you're speaking you have such a strong tone and your verbiage and everything is like really like resonating but i that didn't i would say last year that, that wouldn't have resonated the same so i've definitely opened up my brain to be more receptive of um, you know, what could come out of what the, you know the feelings and um, my own interpretation of it. So so thank you for that. 
So you talked about your process. Um, when we approached you about this opportunity, uh, where was your where was your inspiration driven from? Well, I think that looking at the definitions of because the the when it was described to me, the focus was on this word object and different interpretations of object. And I think the thing that really stood out to me is that there are different definitions of what an object is or defining how to um, or defining an object. And then I believe maybe it was Brittany or you brought up um, object, which is, you know, the same spelling, but a different, you know, completely different word, completely new definition. So just kind of getting wrapped up in those definitions is really what, um, I guess, sparked inspiration in me. And I started to look up different poems that were written in like a dictionary definition form, how I can use those uh, um, you know, elements that they have, as well as just looking up the definition of object and, and what am I interpreting from, you know, Webster's or whoever, however they're defining it and what I'm pulling from those definitions. Nice, nice. Um, okay, well, I would love to dig deep into, um, into your poem. Um, and then, you know, especially for those who are watching at home, you'll be able to see the text uh, come in and you'll be able to see the uh, actual performance piece on YouTube that is also available. Um, so, well, I guess we can start at the top. Um, well, I'll, I'll give the, the overall, my overall sense, senses. I love the layout of your poem. And, um, you know, viewers at home, you'll be able to see that this is not traditional at all. Like they're even the way that the sentences are formed and the way they're broken up, it's not traditional at all. Um, but I think that really speaks to your piece. Can you talk about the purposefulness of, um, you know, the layout of the text? Yeah, I think that as I was reading it, I was thinking of kind of the staccato voice of what a, you know, a dictionary's definition might have. Um, and I tried to, to use the space here to play on that. And you can kind of hear it in like my tone as I read it out loud. Um, yeah, the spacing there is just to give myself breath to kind of give extra definition to the words that, that you know, I'm using that breath to separate. So when I look at this first, well, the second line, at least, I say a thing that can be, and then there's a space, seen, touched. I think from the, the actual definition I looked up, it's a thing that can be seen and touched. Right. Um, but those are, to me, I separate those into three things. It's a thing that can be. It's also a thing that can be seen. And it's also a thing that can be touched. So I, you know, added some space between those because that's how my brain kind of processed it. But it, but it also gives it deeper, deeper meaning, right? Like when you break it up like that, it, it's crazy um, because you don't really realize it until you read it. So I can just imagine reading the dictionary version, a thing that can be seen, touched, a thing that can be seen, touched. It becomes more meaningful when, it, yeah. when you have those breaths in the middle. So I love that. I love that. Can we talk about, there was this one sentence, um, the focus of one's actions, feelings, intent. Could you talk about that? Uh, even, I guess, that whole section, if you like, how did that resonate with you? Yeah, so this second definition, I think it stems more from the object of a sentence. So the object in the sentence is the, the focus of the action in that sentence. So I kind of broke apart again that, you know, definition um, to think about what are the things that, what's the, what is that focus? What is, what is the more political context of what that focus could be? So um, things that came to mind were object of desire or object of investigation. Those things are, they're objects, but they're, they're the focus, you know, of these things, but they're set in a more political context. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that came to mind, which I didn't write, I kind of veered away from it was I was thinking of an unidentified object, you know, and a lot of, of, you know, you know, unjust murders of black people by the police, there's some unidentified object that looked like a gun. So that was kind of a thought I, process I had, but I kind of, I still mentioned kind of the gun um, in the later lines, but I've, I kind of veered away from unidentified object, but yeah. Right, right. Okay, well, actually, this is a good tie-in. Can you talk about the, you as an artist and you as a Black woman and as a, um, you know, as an educator, how does this poem, how does this poem speak to you in, in those, you know, instances? Yeah, I think that I, I mentioned kind of briefly mm -hmm. objects when they're used kind of in a racial context, in a in a police brutality context. But I was also thinking about the objectification of women. Mm -hmm. 
you know, as a black woman, those are things I, I, I experienced, you know, those racial objectifications, but as, as well as those, you know, sexual or, or um, gender based mm -hmm. objectifications as well. So I tried to put a little bit of both into these definitions, because those are part of my personal definitions. Um, I believe in the first one. Yes, I say a girl can be a thing. I try to put more of my, the gender based, um, I guess, commentary in the first definition. I have some more of racial definitions in the second one. And really the third one, um, where I switch to the verb object, I'm thinking of what, what are the things that as a black woman, what do I object to? And how is, how is objecting to something? How is that a revolutionary um, act as well? Right, right. It's interesting to hear you um, talk about, you know, your and how how this poem intercepts with, you know, you being a black woman. And I can definitely I can definitely say that this poem resonates with me being a black man um, and just my own um, interactions, even with police. Um, and, you know, I've been unfortunately uh, actually May of 2020, I was um, I was I was I was I was pulled over for driving while black, uh, simply as that. And um, the only excuse uh, their their excuse was, uh, you know, I fit the description, and I was a black male driving a four door sedan. So looking back at this poem, I'm like, don't objectify me, <laughs> mm -hmm. don't objectify me, and that's exactly what they did. Um, and it's it's just crazy. So this poem this poem speaks and touches on a lot. Um, and I think, um, I think not only, not only black people, but those dealing with, um, any form of trauma or any form of separation can really resonate with this, with this poem. Um, can, can you talk about people, how are people in your personal circle, how are they interpreting this poem or what are their thoughts or comments? I actually don't know. I haven't, um, asked i would say that this is definitely something that as far as form goes i did play a lot with form which is something i've been doing i've kind of stepped away from performance poetry for the past couple of years and i've been really kind of digging into reading writing taking more workshops in and focusing on different things besides just you know performing my raw you know stories right on stage right. and one thing that i've been playing around with a lot is form so i would say some people in my community who are more familiar with my work Mm -hmm. um, this is definitely something that's a little bit more out of the box for the things I typically write. That's at least that's what I think they'd say. And no, I, I'm familiar with some of your earlier work and even your work from 2020. I would say this is very different um, in a good way, though, in a very good way. And I think this could definitely lead you on to some other things. And I'm sure the wheels are turning in your head about that. Um, those who haven't visited the museum, um, I don't know. We have to definitely touch on the visual aspect of this too, because there's a visual. Um, yeah. And it, what's interesting, when Brittany and I, we approached you about this project, um, we definitely had our, our own preconceived notions of what you were going to present. We thought, you know, you were, you were going to be staged in a, in a setting and, you know, there were going to be, um, there were going to be b-roll and other people involved <laughs> and so when you submitted your visual and i'm like i'm like okay this is you know jasmine in front of a, a white wall and that that's what the viewers will see can you talk about can you talk about the uh simplicity of the setting and um can you explain why you chose the setting and how you came to the realization that that was the setting that was going to really speak to the piece because i'm sure i'm sure it did yeah, I definitely wanted something that would highlight um, the words themselves as well as my voice and not anything that would be too distracting from those two things. Mm -hmm. And I also think about when I perform places, it's, it's, it's just me on a stage and that's what people would see if they were to, you know, come see me live or, or see me at a slam. So I didn't want to do anything that would um, stray too much from just kind of the, the simple and, and rooted tradition that is spoken word it's not too much glam and glitz it's right. it's you and the words mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. and you really i think i think by doing that you really put the the you really put the takeaway and the outcomes on the stage you know you're letting that be 
your art. You're letting you, you're putting yourself on the stage because you are your art and you're presenting your art and that's it. So I, I appreciate the simplicity of it. Um, and I think, I think it definitely, or I definitely, it's different than, um, you know, I would say 21st century or millennials. We have this idea of what visuals are and, you know, they're real creative and there's models involved and all this extra stuff. And you really, um, you really set a tone and you, you made your, you made your spoken word, the art, you know, you made it the central point, the central meaning. So I thank you for that. I love that. I love that. Thank totally. Um, during your, your process, when you're, I guess, 50% done with a poem, do you ever share work in progress with anyone or do you find that process very sacred and private? I think when I'm working on my own, mm -hmm. I, and I do want to get out of the habit of doing this, but I don't sh tend to share my work with others. Though I come from such an amazing, I have an amazing writing community here in Philadelphia and tons of people who would you know definitely be willing to look at my work give it a second I give me edits but I tend to not reach out and I think that is definitely a shame however when I'm in workshop settings where it's kind of built in to, to yeah. collaborate with the other participants and and have one-on-ones with the facilitator I definitely do take advantage of all of that when I'm in a setting where you know that's kind of lifted up but on yeah. my own I wish I did take a little bit more initiative there hmm that makes me think. Um, I guess when you're when you're referring to those group settings, what are those like? Is there is it more like a, a sharing session? Do you guys come to the table with your own ideas or are or is it completely formed as a collective? Um, are you speaking to like in workshop form? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I guess it definitely di differentiates depending on the workshop. Some workshops I've come, I've gone to, they say come with stuff that you're already working on and we'll sit down together and, and you know, read it out loud to each other and give each other feedback. And other workshops are more generative where the facilitator right. is giving us prompts. And, and a lot of those poems, you know, after the workshop, they aren't finished poems, but they're, they're new thoughts, they're new processes, there's new bits and pieces that she'll learn in that workshop that she'll take on to, to be in a finished piece. Right. Um, yeah. How does it feel? Like I said, this was a it turned into a collaboration with Delaware College of Art and Design, um, and those works and artist statements have started to come in. And like I said, we'll be drawing those soon and getting those out. Um, but how does it feel to not only have people see your work uh, but also respond to it? Can you talk about that experience? Yeah, that's been definitely amazing. I've had a lot of experience, kind of the other way around, writing. I believe they're called ephrastic poems, which are poems based on artwork. Okay. Um, I've worked with the Philadelphia Museum where, oh, the Philadelphia Art Museum, where we went through the museum, we picked out certain pieces and we kind of paired it with piece, with poems that we already had and did kind of a, you know, uh, event like that. But I've never had artists create work based right. off of my work. So it's definitely very cool. I've been so excited to see the entries coming in. I've been taking a peek at some of them and it's just interesting to see how they've interpreted my work and how they've you know, mingled their own artistic expressions as well as their own stories mm -hmm. um, with my words. It's really cool. Right, and I would, it, as, you're, as you're still looking, but you're gonna definitely see some um, people like they've even intertwined their own personal experience. And um, I would say, I would say there's definitely a continuity with with the theme, they're all they're all thinking of the same things, and so I think that's great. And I can't wait for uh, the viewers um, to see that work. I think they're going to be really excited about that. Um, so that's great. That is really great. Can you talk about your your earlier work? Because I know um, you said this this project um, specifically was a little different. Um, what about your earlier work? Yeah, a lot of my early work has been um, not commission based I would say so it's all it's all been very much just poems that I've had that I've collected and put together and and um, I think that a lot of my early work is very much leaning on the free form version of poems um, as well as experiences from I would say my youth I have two of my 
past books here. This one is my first one, which was came out in 2014. And those these poems in here are very much from my experiences during high school. I mean, even though it's written while I was in college, a lot of those poems were collected over, you know, the span of, you know, when I was in high school up until the first couple years of college. And then my second book, which came out in 2019, you see a lot of more growth in just the things I was experiencing and my perception on things, as well as, you know, the actual writing within the poem. So I would just say growth from experience, from personal experience, as well as just knowledge of art and language and poetry as I've grown and right. studied. So right. yeah, that's why I would say the biggest difference between my future, my, you know, previous work. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, and it's, it's crazy between, between, I would say, you know, spoken word artists and, um, you know, your painters and your photographers, one thing that is consistent is drawing from experience. I say that's, that I would be like the, you know, I wouldn't say the easiest, but you know, it's what, it's what we're comfortable with. You know, these are, this is what we're living. And so, um, you know, as an artist, you're gonna wanna share that. And um, it's interesting because you, you'll see that people, some people are living the same experiences and some people are not. Um, so, you know, it, I, it makes me appreciate, um, you know, this work even more. Um, do you, would you like, is there anything you would want to share with our viewers or, or those who haven't seen, um, your exhibition yet? Um, just any poem or object itself? Uh, any poem or anything, how, whatever you would like to share. I'll say, I'll share this poem. This is one of my favorite poems that I've ever written. I believe I read it at my reading at the Delaware Contemporary. Um, yeah, it's called Safe Space. It's a poem I wrote specifically for my, the friends, the Black women that were around me in college, but I think it translates to all Black women and all Black women's squads. Um, yeah, so it's called Safe Space, a love letter. Yesterday, there was no indictment. Yesterday, the verdict read not guilty while 17 entry wounds in a black boy's back still hummed. When we chanted his name in the streets, the pavement shattered from our vibrato. Yesterday, the cops dragged a black girl to her grave. And when we chanted her name, it echoed. Streets so empty, the pavement threw her name back at us. And it sounded like mine. Yesterday, an Asian kid said nigga and my mouth bled. A Latina mother drowned her dark-skinned babies in bleach. A white girl cornrowed her hair, called it ratchet. And my relaxer burns resurfaced to witness the wreckage. Yesterday, a man pulled a graveyard of little black girls out his closet, paraded them on stage, doused in an old song. And the crowd still sang along for nostalgia's sake. Today, my black woman is a blanket I can't come from under. Today, all of the ways that I might die are too heavy. This bed, the only place the bullseyes can't find me. Today, I didn't think I would survive until a friend invites me to her place, promises whiskey. So I undig my casket, drag myself to a house full of black women and we leave what is hunting us on the other side of the door. Today, we fashion safety from a pearled blunt and a playlist with the volume so high, we can barely hear all that hates us. And we dance, a black girl's dance, our shades of brown converging like a rainbow and an oil slick. I don't know the girl sitting next to me. We both know all the words to this song. So I crown her sister in her eyes the same sad and tired reflected in mine. But her mouth holds a vice grip on joy, smile like rain in the middle of a drought. Yesterday, I figured God had forsaken us. But today I found God in a trap song, in a wine glass whirling her magic around the room in a conversation about hair or lovers. And when oppression worms its way into our conversation, we make a joke of it. Laughing in the face of death is our oldest form of survival. Today, 
Someone who looks like us might have died an unjust death, but their story won't make the news until tomorrow. So today, let sorrow be an unfamiliar language. Dance like you don't know the whole world is out to get you, Black girl. Let every breath be a rebellion, a song that only we know all the words to. And ain't that a triumphant sound? Wow, that is deep. That is really deep. And when, so what is the date of that poem? Ooh, this is from the collection that came out in 2019. So I would say that this, that poem was maybe written 2016. Gosh. Yes. Oh my gosh, you're, I, I'm, I, I love what you're doing and I'm excited to see more of your work. I definitely think um, you're, 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 you're on the right path with your work and, mm -hmm. oh. I, I can definitely see um, your work being an educational piece and people actually really learning from it and resonating with it. And, um, you know, I'm excited to see, you know, I'm excited to see more of your work and, um, and, what, and what, what, comes out, what comes out of you. So um, if you guys have not seen Jasmine Combs' exhibition, um, if you have not read her poem, um, please do. Um, the, the visual can be seen on YouTube um, but also at the museum, the show closes May 25th. So you would want to get here, um, you know, before then and before it goes down. So uh, Jasmine, if there's nothing else you'd like to share, I just want to say thank you um, for sticking with the Delaware Contemporary uh, through all of our planning and execution. Um, we're excited that we've got the chance to collaborate with you. Um, and I just think this is the beginning for us. Yes, yes. Thank you so much again for having me. And I'm excited to work with you all again in the future. Thank you.